بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم um do you want to just come can you like come as close as possible because it saves me having to sh- like shout I'm quite loud anyway so but you know it saves me shout there's nothing like it <laughs> can I just check my uh, you know lingo is still is it still Balasuni yeah. is that correct yeah. Yeah. And what's the reply again <laughs> Was it? Tika. Uh, Tika. That's what that's I was told. Then. I used to live around there, you see. So, you know, I used to try and be a bit hip, you know, getting with the lingo and everything. Most people used to tell me to shut up. I wasn't saying it right, but, you know. <laughs> Today I stand before you as a Muslim man. I'm quite an old man, I'll admit, compared to you. You know, I'm like 33, 33 the other week. I'm getting older, you know, I'm getting a bit old. And I'm a Muslim, alhamdulillah. But I wasn't always a Muslim. There was a time when I was the average Joe, trying to make my way in the world. And I was into all the things that you see outside that go on every day. I'm sure you'll be used to them. I had my clique, my so-called gang. You know, I was into my women. You know, I was much better looking than this. I know you're looking at picture yeah, right? I was much better looking, yeah? <laughs> Try and picture it. I was into my drink. I was into my drugs and my money, and these things meant something to me. I was the sort of person who, to try and describe myself, I was the sort of person who's kind of chased whatever it was that he desired. Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't a shy guy. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see something and think, oh, it's a bit too good for me. I don't know how I'm going to go about that. For me, life was about look. I see something. I want it. And all it is is me planning how I'm going to go and get it. And it didn't matter what it was. Whether it be an actual physical thing, like a car or a gold chain or something, or whether it be a person. I mean, if there was a girl and I saw her and I liked her, I just had to work out how. It wasn't a matter of whether she wanted to or not. Just how, how can I get myself into the right position? Same thing with drink and drugs. And, I mean, I had, to, I had to sell weed in order to be able to support smoking weed. Because, let's face it, where are you going to get the money from to buy it? The best thing to do is to be selling it. And, of course, with your supply, you can always, you know what I mean, scrape off a little 10% yourself, you know, and with the profit from the rest, that would, that would sort out your habit. You understand? So I was the sort of person who would always chase my desires. I didn't let anything go. If I felt that this thing was going to be, make me happy or somehow, you know, fill some sort of void in me, I would go for it. I wouldn't leave it. So to just give you a bit of a picture of, where I'm coming from. I grew up in Brixton. Now, you, most of you are too, in fact, nearly all of you. Is anyone here over 21? Right, you're all too young. You're over 21. I'm sorry to point you out, bro, as the oldest, <laughs> the oldest guy in the room. You know what I mean? Everyone? There's the old guy, yeah? Um, just to give you a picture of, of where I'm coming from. <laughs> Please don't pick on him, bro. I grew up in Brixton, and I grew up at a time when the riots were on in Brixton. Now, you're too young to remember this, but just to give you a bit of the history, there was, uh, around the 80s, there was a period where there was a lot of tension between the blacks in Brixton and the police. See, it was like a ghetto, yeah? And it was mainly black people, it was a mixture of Africans and Jamaicans, most of whom were first generation, they'd just come over. And um, they didn't have good jobs, they were poor, there was a lot of theft, um, you know, a lot of drug smoking, a lot of nonsense going on. The police used to put added pressure on the area because they wanted to try and clear it up. And plus, they were a bit racist, to be honest with you. Uh, they were racist. And there was a lot of tension between the two parties. And it literally became a black and white thing. And one day, it just it kicked off. Um, it was the summer of 1981. It kicked off one night um, when the police beat up a guy in the street. And everyone just got, went crazy. I mean, shops were burnt down. Cars were burnt, overturned. And I was about nine when this happened. And... The road that I lived on, Summer Layton Road, literally was where the riot took place. I mean, I, I, in my bedroom, I could see the whole thing. The police on one side, some of them on horses, some of them on foot with the, uh, you know, with, with the plastic guards. I could see all the people on the other side throwing petrol bombs, this, that, and the other. And that was the first time I saw a man burn. I actually saw a man screaming on fire, burning, and I'm nine, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, that's crazy, man. I mean, one side of me was kind of just in shock. The other side of me was just, I wanted to actually get out there and 
you know what I mean, try and defend my peoples or whatever. I remember my mum was working nights because she was a nurse and she was a single parent. And it's just me and my two sisters. My older sister was 12. My younger sister was six. So we're all kids in the house, yeah? Um, most people will say, well, she shouldn't have left you on your own. But she didn't really have any choice but to do that in order to bring money into the house. And somebody was banging on the door and we didn't know, was it a policeman? Was it somebody trying to... So we snuck downstairs with all the lights off. And we were trying to appear to find out who it is. And basically, somebody had been hurt. I think they'd been stabbed or something. And all we knew is that in the morning, there was like blood. And what it is, they'd seen the lights on in the house and was banging to say, can you help me? But obviously, we were kids we were too scared to open the door. So this was kind of the place that I came from. So just to give you an understanding of why I would be the sort of person who would want to join in gangs, why I would be the kind of person that would want to get involved in the street, in the street life. My mum who was really scared that I was going to grow up to be a gangster, decided to move us a couple of years later to Milton Keynes. Anyone know Milton Keynes? Right? Weird place. It started off, with, it's getting weirder. And to be quite honest with you, the gang culture over there is growing fast. I mean, you've got Bedford and Northampton as well. And these are all cliques. And some of these guys, they're not a ramp. I mean, you go over there and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. You, you, you can get hurt. What happened is I went over there and all of a sudden I'd gone from being being like blacks versus whites in Brixton to being a minority black person in what was necessarily a white area. So I felt under pressure to join a gang there because I needed somebody to just get my back to look after me. So what my mum was trying to save me from didn't really work because now I was just in a different type of gang, you know. Um, and the consequence of being in the gangs over there is I actually had to kind of flee Milton Keynes. My excuse was to come to uni because what happened was we actually had a skirmish outside a petrol station. Um, uh, some people got hurt quite badly, yeah? And the police were dragging people in one by one to interview them because, as you know, most petrol stations have got CCTV cameras. So it was on the CCTV camera, they could slowly pick out who done what. And they hadn't come for me, and I was wondering why, but some of my boys actually told me that they'd been shown the video of what had happened, and I was too dark. <laughs> I wasn't actually showing up properly on the video because <laughs> it's black and white. So that's why they hadn't brought me in. So I managed to get away with that, yeah? Um, but because of that, I actually l l decided like, to really push to go to university. I had to go through clearance. But I ended up at Queen Mary's, which you know is just on Milan Road. Yeah? Um, I ended up at that university. And it was there that I became a Muslim. All right? So alhamdulillah, um, I became a Muslim in your community. And um, you know, I really enjoyed my time there. So today I stand before you as a Muslim, with all that stuff which I've told you is now in the past. And... What's beautiful about it is, for me, is that I would now, by Allah, I would now defend you, who I've just met. Most of you, I don't know what your names are. Most of you I've never seen before, but by Allah, I would defend you over my own flesh and blood. Over my own flesh and blood. People I don't even know. That's how much of a change Islam has had in my life. And I've so much as told my family this. They know the score. They know the score. Sometimes they go, say, well, you care about the Muslims more than you care about us. Oh, yeah, I do. That's my family now. Islamic history, our history, that's my history. The history of black people and slaves, that's not my history. That's something that happened to a people of color. My history is the history of Islam. That's how much change has happened in my life. So you can imagine how vexed I get when I look at Muslims, young Muslim boys and girls, just like yourselves, and I just see the complete opposite to the way I feel. The complete opposite. To start with, the free mixing. I'm not even going to say boyfriend, girlfriend, because I've taken it too far already. Just the free mixing on its own. Yeah, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Do you know what? I was working in Islington. I worked there for eight years. And there's a college in Islington. I don't know if you, any of you know the college. Any of you go to the college? You know if you go to Islington College? There's a college in Islington, right? And it was built whilst I was working there. So it wasn't there when I started working in the place, but after a few years they built it. And strangely enough, there's loads. I, mean, I, don't, I didn't know there's that many Muslims around that area, but there's loads of Muslims that go there. Now, the only reason I know that the girls are Muslim is because I've seen them getting off the buses and taking off their hijabs. That's how I know. 
And I've seen the girls and the boys, there's a park. Um, when you come out the station, you take a left, there's a, there's a, there's a little park. It's, um, I don't know, some sort of memorial memory of something or other. You know what these people are like. They have memory about everything, man. Big park bench there. <laughs> some sort of memorial thing. And sometimes I used to go, when I used to go and buy my lunch, I'd buy my sandwiches and that. On the way back, I'd see the kids all hanging around in this park. And it's mainly, it's mainly the Asian kids. Mainly. Now, the boys think they're rough, you know, they've got like, you know, not one or two lines in their brow, but like, they, they might just take the brow off, man. <laughs> you know, there's like nothing left, you know what I mean? And they're all giving it, you know, yeah, 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 what, 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 yeah. And uh, the girls are sitting on their laps and, you know what I mean, oh, I don't have to describe to you, we're fasting, you know, things that's going on. Bare open in the public, yeah, no shame, no nothing. And I just, I, I, really, brothers, I, 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 stuff like that just it makes me feel shocked. They just make, I just, what, why? Why? Because you're no different. You're no different. And what bugs me is that you, you, I see some of these girls, when they go, it's time to go back on the bus, now they're... Yeah. Why? Why? At least if, if you consider that it is not worth wearing, if you consider that it is just a piece of material, then why? Who are you trying to make happy? Who are you trying to make happy? Your community? Your friend? Who? Allah can see what you're doing anyway. It's not like you're pleasing him. So who are you fooling? The bus driver? Me? <laughs> I see the drugs. Much worse, bro. Me, I never took no heroin. But whilst I was living in East London, I saw the heroin. <coughs> and it's young kids. And you know, you guys know, you live in this area. Tower Hamlets? Bruh, it's a mess. Do you guys know Umberston Street? You know the Lahore and Umberston Street on Commercial Road? Yeah, you know this little, yeah, yeah. you know the estate at the end of that road? I once wandered in there, yeah? Like a fool I am. <laughs> not knowing what, <laughs> not knowing the estate. And luckily somebody said to me, you know what bro, you know anyone like here and that? You know, I was trying to do, I was trying to be, I was trying to do my Dawa thing. I was walking in and hoping to meet people. And one guy, I must have one brother said to me, do you know anybody like, you got any family or any crew or anything? I said, no. I said, look, do yourself a favor, bro. Don't, you know, don't hang around it. Bro, they don't even deliver pizzas there. <laughs> they don't. They don't. They don't. I don't know, maybe it's changing, but I don't, when I was living, they don't deliver pizzas there. That estate was actually on a documentary. I remember three or four years ago, I saw a documentary on that estate. And there was a young guy who had a heroin problem. And he couldn't feed it. And do you know what he did? Young guy, Bengali, Muslim. In order to feed his habit, he got his sister hooked on the drug to feed his habit. Are you thinking, oh, that made no sense? You see, once she was hooked on the drug, she couldn't exactly argue about him becoming her pimp. Once she was hooked on the drug, it was like, how are we going to feed? How are we going to get any more? You're going to have to. You're going to have to. So he was basically out there scouting for her, getting little old white men and to come, sleep with his sister, pay, and that's how they'd get their drugs. And he did this to her on purpose. He knew what he was doing. I saw this, this live. I saw this on the TV live. They had the cameras there. And I recognized the estate. And I remember thinking, subhanAllah, is it that bad? Is it that bad that Muslims would stoop to that level where they would pimp their own sisters. SubhanAllah. Now this is the one that I really, I see this all the time and I just don't understand it. I really don't understand it. I see young Muslims so consumed by this street culture, it's almost like they want it, they wish they was black. Walking around, bleh, 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 bleh. Wait, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Not even doing it properly after the time. <laughs> I know, trust me, I was there. I come from that. I come from that. Trust me, there is nothing, there is nothing in that perception, that type of culture, that street thing. There is nothing for you there. It is a void, a black hole with no, no goodness in it. No goodness in it whatsoever. Take it from me. Wallahi, I swear to you. There is nothing in there worth what? That, you think there's a black community? Does anybody here think that there is a black community? You're, in, you're, you're naive if you do. 
trust me, as black as I am, and even black people think I'm black, <laughs> right? As black as I am, I can't, if I go to Brixton with a 50 pound note dangling out of my pocket, believe me, I will get mugged just the same as any other colour. There ain't no black community. It's a farce. It's something the newsreaders say to try and make out like Britain is some kind of happy go lovey place. There ain't no black community. Everybody's out for themselves. That's what street culture's about. It's about me, 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 me. That's what it's about. And I know. I used to hang around enough clicks. And believe me, every single day you have to prove yourself again. Every single day. You're only as good as your last fight. You've got to prove yourself again. A man will take anything off you. He's your brethren, all right? But you can't leave him with your phone. You can't leave him with your money. You can't even leave him with your girl. There's no community there. I don't know what, and do you know what bugs me the most? Well, actually, I said that already, isn't it? <laughs> this bugs me as well. Is <laughs> that when you actually look at the amount of people coming into Islam, and if you're out there, and if you're seeing the people that are converting, the people that are converting the most in this country are black males, young black males. They're coming to Islam in their droves. They want what you have, what you were born with. An understanding of Qur'an and Sunnah. They're gasping for that. That's a bit strange, don't you think? I see young Muslims trying to be, trying to be the British 50 cent. And I see black kids with nothing but the street as their culture. And they're gasping for Islam. Isn't that proof enough that there's nothing in that street culture worthwhile? And then there's Bollywood. <laughs> what is that about, man? I would I really, I would love for somebody to explain to me how on earth that has managed to seep into the understanding of Muslim youth. You know, when I was at work, there was a guy who joined the company. His name was Muhammad. He actually joined the company to take over my role, so I was actually training him up. And this subject of Bollywood came up, and he told me something. He said that he'd gone to a wedding, and one of his young cousins, a girl, she's young though, so she was allowed to go into both areas, because she was, you know, young, because their wedding was, you know, split, separated, as, we, as our weddings are. She came and she said to him, she said, Uncle, he said, yeah. She said, uh, where's all the dancing girls in? She didn't understand. She said, I thought this was a wedding. You see, her perception of what a wedding is, is what she sees on the films. With what's his name? What's that guy? Shara? Is it Shara Khan? <laughs> That's her perception of a wedding. <laughs> Me personally, I don't get it. I don't understand what the attraction is. It's, the, it's, it's like a high pitched noise of some woman popping her from behind a tree. <laughs> what is that, man? But, but, you know, the, but the truth of it is that the message is always the same, isn't it? It's always girl, girl needs love. Cool guy wants to give girl love. Nasty uncle trying to spoil things. Mother-in-law won't stop talking. The story's always the same. But it's just bare munker. There is never a decent message or concept from Islam in this film. It is the culture of another, a completely different people. And yet, the Muslims are so consumed by it. Our sisters, they want to be actresses and, 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 and fall in love with this romantic guy with his hair coming out of his chest. <laughs> and guys, they don't, want to, they don't want to bother with the message. They don't want to bother with learning the Quran. They don't want to bother with this. They want to try and find this beautiful girl who's walking around all the hair hanging out. And, what? That's the message? And you can tell when it's munker, when the non-Muslims love it so much. When was the last time you saw a play about... Tajweed or a play about in the West End. When was the last time you saw that? But they have Bombay dreams, all right? <laughs> oh, yeah. They love all that. They want it promoted. They want to draw you further away from Islam. They, they think this is beautiful. This is Asian culture, isn't it? This is the good part of Asian culture. Let's all get together and have a dance, have a drink, mix. <coughs> Let's push it. Let's promote it. <coughs> You know the BBC have got these little skits that do, you know, in between programs. You must have seen the one with the, the, the Indian dancers. Yeah. Comes on just before he said this. <laughs> yeah, you know you watch his sentence. Yeah? You know the one I'm talking about. 
When was the last time you saw one of those and the person was making the dua? Or you saw one of those and there's a whole lot of people going into sujood. They've got everything else. They've got skateboarders. They've got handicapped people playing basketball. You've seen them all, innit? There's tons. It represents every type of society apart from us. You can all, there's always a little telltale sign to when something is not Islamic. Because they start to promote it. So let's, let's, let's try and move away from this Bollywood culture. It's not for us. But it's not just Muslim youth. You know what? All youth in this society... Sorry, my, my blood stopped flowing in my legs. Now. Let me try and sit in a different position. All youth in this society suffer from these ails. Suffer from this. Suffer from the, the ailment of the drugs. Suffer from the ailment of the drinks. Suffer from the ailment of not being able to discuss with their parents because they feel like they're on a completely different level. All youth. It's not just the Muslims. But there's a difference between you, the Muslim youth, and other youth. There is a big difference between you. You see, for the non-Muslim, and I've been there so I know, I'm well qualified, I'm like a, I'm like a professor in this subject. I know what it is to be non-Muslim and then to be Muslim. And I tell you, to be non-Muslim is to live a life where you literally are the master. Where you put yourself in the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as far as you're concerned, it doesn't matter where you came from. And it sure don't matter where you're going. So this life becomes ultimately important and you are the master of your own life. So you don't wake up in the morning and say, Alhamdulillah. You wake up in the morning and you say, I am the Don Dada. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, that is the way non-Muslims think. The non-Muslim youth thinks he is in complete control of his own life. It's, his whole goal in life is to find his own happiness. So if he wants, like I told you before, if he sees something and he wants it, he's just got to think, how do I maneuver myself to get? That's the only barrier. If I want to smoke, all I've got to do is find the drugs. If I want a girl, all I've got to do is convince her. If I want a car, all I've got to do is steal it. <laughs> this is it. Solomon, am I lying? This is it. This is the thinking. Right and wrong, that's up here. That's up here. If I think it's right, I don't care what anyone else says. But that isn't the thinking of a Muslim. That isn't the thinking of a Muslim. A Muslim believes he came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where's he going to go? He's going to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is this life about? It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a Muslim wakes up in the morning, he doesn't think I'm the Don Dada. He thinks Allah is. He says, Alhamdulillah, that I have been given yet another day to try and prove myself. That's the difference. He doesn't think, I feel like a, I feel like a spliff, I'll go and have one. He might think to himself, I feel like a spliff, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Astaghfirullah. Why? Because he doesn't want to transgress the boundaries. His goal in life is different. It doesn't fit with his goal in life. It's not about seeking his happiness. It's about seeking the happiness of Allah. So you have no excuse to act like the non-Muslim youth. Because you have a different mindset. You have a different set of goals and a different set of values. So you have to stick to those values and that will make you different from the non-Muslim youth. And with these in mind, all youth will do the same thing. Whether you be the kind of person who thinks they're the Don Dada because they control their own life, or whether you be the kind of person who thinks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one in control, is Lord, is the one you need to please. We'll do the same thing. We will look for role models within the society that we can try and aspire to. Now, unfortunately, what's happening is we're all looking at the same role models. We're all looking at people like David Beckham. We're all looking at people like... Jay-Z, the same role models apply across the board. For some people, Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> it is. But the fact of the matter is, what do these role models have to offer in terms of your goal in life? How does this role model help you in your goal in life? It will be, almost be like studying for a history exam 
by reading children's nursery rhymes. It would be. You're studying for a history exam, and you're going to revise by reading children's nursery rhymes. That is what trying to get into Jannah and having a role model as Jay-Z is. It's a complete waste of time. You're going to fail. So who should your role models be? Let me give you one. Let me give you one. I might give you a few more, but I'll just give you one. Just give you one. I'm not going to come out of a man. I'm actually going to pick a sister. I'm going to pick a sister. Her name, Um Amara. She fought in the Battle of Uhud. She fought in the Battle of Uhud. Has anyone here had a fight? Has anyone here ever, ever had a fight? Ever swung a punch? Ever been punched? You've had a fight, yeah? Was it hard? It was, it was hard, isn't it? Fighting ain't easy. <laughs> fighting ain't easy. No, I'm not joking. Fighting ain't easy. You know on TV, the Hollywood fights, don't think that's a fight. <laughs> Trust me, most fights, yeah, they'll last 30 seconds. And you're like that. <laughs> yeah? One punch, and you can't actually punch again with the same hand, yeah? Because your hand's just like throbbing. That's a real fight. And that's nothing. When they used to fight, at the time of Muhammad, and at the time of the Sahaba, that was a fight. They used to have swords, which most of us wouldn't be able to lift now, with both hands. They used to bring them like this. They used to lift them in the air and shout, Allahu Akbar. Most of us wouldn't be able to lift the sword up. <laughs> Solid steel swords. This is a woman. She fought in the Battle of Uhud. And then she fought in the greatest battle the Muslims had fought up until that time. You've heard of Khalid bin Walid, right? Yeah. yeah, Sword of Allah. He was leading the army. and She was in it. She was in it. And you know who they were fighting? They were fighting Musaylamah. You know who Musaylamah was? Musaylamah was a guy who, whilst the Prophet ﷺ was alive, he claimed he was also a prophet. And he managed to gather a lot of support. And there was another guy called Nahar, let me get his name right, Nahar Ir Rajal. And this guy, Nahar Ir Rajal, he came to Medina with a whole lot of other delegates. At the time. They called it the year of delegation, when lots of people came and swore allegiance to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to Islam. And he came with these people. And he came on behalf of the Bani Hanifa. The Bani Hanifa. He came on their behalf. But when most of them left, he stayed behind, this guy Rajal. He stayed behind and he stayed very close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And over the next few months, he learned a lot of Qur'an. He was able to recite it. And he became quite scholarly. And his name was beginning to get around Arabia as somebody who, you know, you could go to and you could ask about things and he could say, yes, this is the answer because I heard the Prophet say it. So with all this knowledge, he actually got sent by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to sort out Musaylamah. He said, can you go and sort this guy out? Because he's in your turf. He's Banu Hanifa. He's in your turf. Can you go and explain that this guy is a liar and he's not a prophet? So this guy Rajali goes, but you know what he does? When he gets back there, he joins him with Musaylamah. He goes and he says, yeah, I've been with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told me that this guy is real. That's what he did. So now people will come flocking in, thinking that this guy Musaylamah is also a prophet from God. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he dies while this guy is still telling these lies. And Abu Bakr Siddiq becomes the leader of the Muslims. And he sends an army out with Khalid at the head of the army to go and fight this Musaylamah. And in that army were Washi, you know the guy that killed Hamza, the black guy that wanted to call a savage with the spear, he was there, and so was the sister, Um Amr. And she fought. And you know, in this battle, in this, her son was with her, her son was actually in the battle as well, they fought alongside each other. In this battle, she lost her hand. She went to strike somebody, they blocked it, and they cut off her hand. So she grabs a sword with the other hand and continues to fight and her, her son, he couldn't handle it anymore. He couldn't handle seeing his mum and his situation. So he drags her off the battlefield. And you know, after the battle, the Muslims won this battle. It was the greatest battle they fought up until then. 1,200 Muslims died. That was the biggest number had ever fought in one battle. After this battle, Khalid bin Walid was so impressed with this sister that he made sure she got urgent attention and gave her the best medical care. Do you know what the best medical care was at that time? They poured hot oil on her wounds. Hot, boiling oil on her wounds. That was the best medical attention. And you know what this sister said? 
She said, Alhamdulillah. She said, but if I had known how much this hot oil would have burned, I would have asked you to amputate, cut off my limb, rather than put the oil on. SubhanAllah. That's a wrong word. That's what I'm talking about. Forget Shah Khan, Jay-Z. That's rock hard. You know Tariq bin Ziyad? 17 years old. He was a general. <laughs> 17 years old. A general of an army. And he gets sent to fight. What's the river that he crossed? I wrote it down here. He got sent to fight in Spain. He crossed the Straits. He crossed the Straits from North Africa into Europe to go fight King Roderick. King Roderick at the time was feared. He was the king of Spain. And his army swamped, swamped Tariq's army. Some narrations say Tariq had 70,000, some say 7,000. The fact of the matter is, King Roderick had way over that number. In fact, when the Muslims turned up with Tariq and they saw the, uh, the Spanish army they were going to fight, they thought, whoa, didn't see that coming. So Tariq bin Ziyad saw that his men, there might be a little bit of fear in there when he saw the size of the army. Seventeen. And they'd arrived on ships. So do you know what he did? He told them, get in your boats. Let's sail over. Let's sail onto the shore and fight. And halfway while they were sailing, he told the archers, he said, light your arrows and burn the ships that we came in. Now, I don't know. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine being there. If I'm an archer, I'm probably thinking, He's gone mad, didn't he? <laughs> but they did it. So they light their arrows and they fire them at their own ships. So now the ships are ablaze. The ships are burning. The ships are sinking. And he turns to his men and he says to them, In front of you lies death or victory, fisabilillah. And behind you lies disgrace and the deep blue sea. And his men shout, Allahu Akbar. Do you know King Roderick's army started running when they saw the Muslims approaching the shore? Because think about it from their perspective. You way outnumber this lot. But they burnt the ships they came in. They ain't going anywhere. And they're screaming, Allahu Akbar, and they're coming at you as fast as they can. They fought, all right, but the Muslims came them. Because most of their army took off. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with this lot. 17 years old. Look at the decision he made at 17. Now, that's a role model. That's what I'm talking about. Forget David Beckham or Zinedine Zidane. Zinedine Zidane was only able to do that. <laughs> Tariq bin Ziyad conquered an entire country. He started a new era in Islam, Islam in Europe. And Spain, Andalus, it became like the center of Islam. It was the most technologically advanced capital city we had. And you know what? They named after him the highest mountain there. You know Gibraltar? You've heard of Gibraltar? Mm -hmm. It's Jabal Tariq. That's where they get the name from. Jabal Mountain Tariq. That's where they get the name from. That's how the youth of Islam used to behave. Mashallah. That's the role model. Shall I give him another one? Musab ibn Umar. Musab ibn Umar was a sahab. Radiallahu an. You know, before he came into Islam, Musab ibn Umar was a playboy. I can't I know how to describe him. He was very good looking, similar to me. Very good looking. <laughs> very, very good looking. He was rich. His mother was wealthy. And she was a very astute woman. You know, people knew of her in society. She commanded a lot of respect. And uh, she was the one person who he'd listened to. Other than that, he really didn't have to listen to anyone. He was invited to all the parties, all the... If anything was going on, and you didn't invite Musa bin Omer, it wasn't worth going to. You know? He was able to discuss with the elders anything. Charismatic. You know, one of the best bachelors around. Women, all women wanted to marry him. And when he heard about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this message that he was sending, he went to have a peek. He went and listened. 
And it, it affected him so much that he became a Muslim in secret. He became a Muslim in secret because he didn't want to tell his mum. His mum, he feared his mum over anybody else in Korea. She didn't mind the rest of them, but he didn't want to tell his mum. But when she found out, because people had seen him sneaking into the house of Arkham, where they used to recite Quran and stuff, and other people saw him praying like Muhammad prays, she found out. And what she did is basically she cut off his money. She cut off his money. She said, you're not my son whilst you're doing this nonsense. And you know, there came a time when this guy, who everybody knew as basically the man to be, there came a time when Sahabi used to talk about how they would walk down the street and they would see Musa ibn Umar coming the other way and they would lower their head in shame. They would lower their head in shame that they had not given as much as this guy. This guy was so poor. His clothes were so rugged. You know when he died? When he died after a battle, they were unable to cover him. The cloth he was wearing, because you know when people die, they normally they just they'd cover them. You know, in, in, a, in a battle, you've got a lot of people to bury. So in the beginning, they just cover you to give you a bit of decency. But when they tried to cover him with what he was wearing, it wouldn't, it wouldn't cover him. They'd like pull it over his head and his feet would show. And pull it over his feet and his head would show. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came and he saw this, he made dua for him. And he told the people, collect lemongrass. Put the thing over his head, collect lemongrass and put it over his feet. This is how, look at the beauty of this. Young guy, Musa ibn Umar. I think when he died, he was only around 22. Young guy. Look at the example. Look at the, look at the message it sends. Look what he gave up for Islam. That's a role model. That is somebody that we should be looking to and saying, do you know what? I'd love to be like that guy. Not 50 cent. Not 50 cent. 50 cent is a chief on steroids. Mm -hmm. Really. Talking nothing but monk. That is the way to Jahannam, what he's talking about. That's not a role model for us. We don't fear 50. We fear Allah. Talking about how he got shot nine times and he's still alive. You should say, Alhamdulillah, you cheat. <laughs> what, you think you're the one that's keeping you alive? You think it's you that kept you alive? What, you were able to make the bullet go into certain places, were you? <laughs> what, they shot you and you went, <laughs> Huh? See the audacity of some of these people. But some of we follow them. Why? Why do you want to make a role model of somebody like this? Who's obviously talking nonsense. Doesn't understand the reality of what's going on. Got my notes upside down. So if these are role models. What should we be doing? What should we be doing? What am I trying to tell you? What, am I, what, what, what message am I giving you? The message I'm trying to give you here is, you know what? Islam is in a situation today where it's under blatant attack every day, and you know this. Me and these brothers were just discussing just now about this attack on the niqab that they've just come out. Jack Straw had the audacity, had the audacity after he's been telling us. That this is the land of freedom and we shouldn't oppress people and we shouldn't force women to wear, to wear things. We shouldn't force people to put things on. He's now trying to force people to take things off. Islam is under attack. And you're the youth of Islam. Did you know that in this country you make up 31%? The youth make up 31% of all the Muslims. This is the highest proportion of youth anywhere. The non-Muslim youth make up 31% of their population. So their government is going to come after you. They want you to be the person that carries Islam. Now, how are you going to carry it? How are you going to carry it? How are you going to be an ambassador for Islam? Are you going to say, it's all right to fornicate, it's all right to have girlfriends? Are you going to say, it's all right, you know, drugs is a problem, but, you know, it's all right to have recreational drugs? Are you going to say, it's all right, you can, you know, you can have a drink, have a drink or need, it's all right, it's one special day? Are you going to say your role models are people like David Beckham and 50 Cent and Jay-Z and Shah Rukh Khan? Is that what's going to happen? Are you going to be true to Islam? Are you going to speak the haq about Islam? Are you going to describe Islam as it should be? Are you going to hold fast to Islam and be an example so that people can look at you and say, these are the youth of Islam and they live it. It isn't just a story for them. You have to learn about Islam. 
learn about the deen which you represent. Because if you don't know anything about it, how are you going to describe it to somebody else? If somebody asks you why you do a particular thing, how are you going to tell them? Do you know the amount of people that pray five times a day and recite surah after surah? And you ask them, what does a surah mean? They don't know. You don't know. Find out. You all know Surah Al-Kafirun. Find out what it means. When was it sent? Why was it sent? Learn. Learn about the deen that you're in. And put Allah before your rizq. You know what rizq is? Your rizq is your sustenance. Your sustenance is your money. It's, your, it's, it's what you own. What is given to you. What you will earn. Whether it be your pocket money, whether it be your, your hobbies, whether it be your car if you drive, whether it be... Whatever it is that you, you have, which you could say, alhamdulillah for, put Allah before this thing. Because it comes from Allah in the first place. And the biggest mistake we all make is we think we have to put this thing first. I'll give you an example. Some people are brilliant footballers. And it might just be that the football club wants you to do something on a Friday afternoon. So you're going to have to miss Jummah. So you think, yeah, you know what, it's only one. I'll go. This is a big chance for me. You know, might be to show my skills. You never know, I might be picked up by an agent. I'm using this example because this is a recent example that I just saw. This is a big, big mistake. This is a big, big mistake. Because anything that you earn, anything, the skill alone that you have, Allah gave it to you. Anything that you would earn as a footballer, even if you made it to the premiership, this is from Allah. Allah has already decided how much rizq you will get from the day you were born. Whether you were going to have a million, whether you are going to have 50p, whether you are going to be in benefits all your life. This has already been decided. And now you want to go and upset Allah trying to chase what, Allah, what it is that Allah already gives you. This is a nonsense. It doesn't actually make any sense, does it? What is the point in upsetting Allah over something that only He can give you? When I heard about this, I said to the brother, you made a grave, grave, grave mistake. You made a grave mistake leaving your Jummah to go for this thing. You should have explained to them, I cannot do it at that time. And if they say, well, that's the only time, we'll say, well, then it's not for me. Don't put your rizq before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn about the society you're in. Don't just think, you know, because you live amongst other brothers and it's, you know, I know it's nice. You know, most people here are Bengali as well. And, you know, everyone eating the same food, talking the same language. And it's nice. It's comfortable. It's comfortable. But I'm here amongst you. I'm not Bengali. I'm here amongst you just because I'm Muslim. And you know what? We as Muslims, we need to go out there as well. And we need to meet the non-Muslims. We need to invite them around. We need to let them come and have iftar with us. Explain things to them. We need to know what's going on. We need to know who Jack Straw is. There's going to be plenty of sisters, aunties, mums out there who wear niqab. They don't even know who is attacking them. They don't know. Because we don't get involved. We don't understand what's going on in this country. It affects us. So get involved. Read the newspapers, listen to the news on TV, find out what they're saying, speak to people, find out what their opinion is, explain to them, oh, you've got this wrong, brother. You've got this wrong. It's not oppression. The sisters are wearing this because they're trying to obey Allah. Have you ever asked them? Get involved. Speak to people. This is how you become an ambassador of Islam and you spread the dawah this way. And do not fall into the trap of kufr. It is a trap. I've been there. I came from there. I don't, know how, I don't know how to tell you better. I came from there. There is nothing good there. It leads to Jahannam. That's it. There's nothing good in there. It is a seduction. It pulls you in. The lure of parties and clubs, drugs, girls, it sucks you in. I'll give you a, a, a piece from the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in Surah Intifah, Infitar. By the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, He says, Ya ayyuhal insanu ma yagharrika bi rabbikal kareem. 
الذي خلق كفص واقع فأد الله في أي صورة ما شاء ركب كلا بل تكذبون بالدين says oh mankind what has seduced you from your Lord what has taken you away from your Lord so bountiful who created you and fashioned you in due proportion fashioned you the way you've been created and gave you a just bias that you're already biased towards justice in whatever form he wills short, tall, black, brown, white but still you reject the right and the judgment Allah's asking what is so great that you have moved away from the one that created you something which you had no say in, no choice in but you're so proud of that you want to go and, 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 and exploit it and, 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 and enjoy the, 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 the things which he has told you are haram who has pulled you away? and he carries on وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِذِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَا لَمُونَ مَا تَحْلُونَ إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ وَإِنَّ الْقُجَّارَ لَفِي جَحِيمٍ يَسْلَوْنَ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ وَمَا هُمْ أَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ Truly there are angels appointed over you, kind and honorable, writing down your deeds. Every single one of us, everything we do is being recorded. <coughs> and they know and understand all that you do. You cannot escape it. From a blink of an eye to an intention you have in your heart, record it. وَإِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ As for the righteous, the good, the ones who follow, the haq, they will be in the bliss. وَإِنَّ الْفُجَّارَ لَفِي جَهِيمٍ And as for the wicked, they will be in the fire. يَسْلَوْنَ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ Which they will enter on the day of judgment. وَمَا هُمْ أَنْهَا بِغَائِبِينَ And they will not be able to stay away from it. Brothers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he promised us victory. We know this is going to come, inshallah, bismillah. And one day, you know what? Young guys like you will study in schools. Inshallah, bismillah. Will study in schools when Islam is again victorious. And they will look back in the history of those that stood up for Islam. Those that spoke the haq when Islam was under attack. Let your names be amongst those people. Let your names be amongst those people that young kids read about. And think, subhanAllah, I want to be like him. He was 17. He was 18. And Islam was under attack. Every time they turn on the TV, Islam was under attack. You watch a film, the bad guy is always an Arab. On the radio, it's show after show about Islam. And how it's oppressive. And, and they stood up in all of this. And they said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, I will speak the haq about Islam. I will not be violent. I will not be a simple a thug that just goes out in the streets and acts like an idiot. I will learn about my deen and I will learn about the society and I will go out there and I will discuss about Islam. Even though there are people out there who want to punch me. Even though there are people out there who want to shout me down. Even though the media hates me. Even though they show a picture of me. I can't even go, I can't even go on an airplane with everyone on the airplane so I don't want to fly. Because that guy looks like a Muslim. But you stood strong. Be amongst those people that the kids read about and they're proud of. Because at the age you are at now, this is it, this is it now. You know, the average age of the Sahaba was 19. They weren't old. They weren't old. I'll leave you with one little thing. There are three types of people in this world. Only three types. There are those that make things happen. And there are those who watch while things happen. And then there are those who wonder... What happened? Be the first one. Be the first one.